since there's another thing we're going to go over. Seems like uh, we've been on these the nursing home rotation quite frequently lately. In November and then in December. And now again in just a few more weeks we have the first week of February. So it's coming up here very shortly as well. We want to look tonight, we're going to take a break from our, our uh, books and uh, kind of as a vision. And I'm hoping for some feedback tonight. Uh, if not, it may be a very short service tonight. Uh, but a, a kind of a verse challenge as we start off, uh, very similar to what we looked at on Sunday, just a single verse that we know so well, but many times neglect to put it into practice. This is another one of those. In fact, this is one of those verses that is often taken out of context. And uh, there's a few of those. We've gone over 1 Corinthians 7, 13, another verse that is many times taken out of context. That verse, again, does not mean that we'll never face anything that is difficult. Uh, certainly, if we look even in the testimony of those written in the Word of God, many of them live through some very difficult, trying times. Um, but what the verse actually is stating is, regardless of what we're going through, our God is always bigger than that. At least bigger than our problem. And uh, what a joy it is to be able to, the very next verse, flee from idolatry, flee from allowing anything else to remind us or to take away from us how big our God is. And uh, so, like that verse, we want to look at Proverbs 29 18. A verse that is a great verse to start off the year, especially, and again, hopes that we will have some discussion here at the end in regards to this, some. Uh, I guess while you're turning there, a lot of times in our annual business meeting, after we go through all the routines of our normal business meeting, uh, usually on the agenda we have something along the lines of uh, kind of looking forward to the year and what we would like to accomplish and uh, according with the budget and all of that. And uh, typically, uh, by the time we get through all the routines of what we have to get through and the things that are required of us at the beginning of the year, uh, the nominations and budgets and all of that, that uh, this conversation usually goes very quick and uh, often not have a lot of discussion. So I wanted to discuss it tonight so we can prepare for the business meeting in two weeks and uh, even adjust the budgets if necessary in that regard. But in this verse, oh, I did not cancel out this. Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Uh, what is interesting about this verse is how many times it's taken or interpreted incorrectly. And what is also fascinating to me is uh, many pastors, authors, people that are quoting this verse would normally never quote from the King James in any other instance. When they use refer to this verse, it is almost always the King James. And uh, I think there's something to be said in that regard of uh, maybe something is not being interpreted right here as far as our interpretation of it. And when it's the misinterpretation, is always coming from a single version. Ultimately, all the other versions seem to be much clearer as far as what the words actually mean. Uh, because as it states for us in our English, or in our old English, this verse is easily misinterpreted. Um, what is also interesting, uh, I think I had a quote here, and I'm losing it. I think it was Rick Warren. Hey, quote, and I know I was working on, aha, here we go. A quote from Rick Warren. Again, I'm not certainly not supporting or promoting or anything along those lines, but this is something that Rick Warren said. My imagination influences my aspiration. In other words, your dreams determine your destiny. To accomplish anything, you must first have a mission, a goal, a hope, a vision. And then he quotes this verse, again from the King James. Uh, push it up, middle chart, where there is no vision, the people perish. And uh, what's sad in that regard is that that's, that's not what this verse is about. And even just that thinking, that, that, that the objective of life, I think, is, is not biblical. It's not, it's not right to have this concept that uh, you just have to have a vision. And then if you, as long as you have a vision, it'll happen. Certainly, I think many times that is the case. Many times, humanly speaking, we have a vision and we will push and drive and uh, force ourselves until that, that dream becomes a reality. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that is a biblical reality. It doesn't mean that's a biblical uh, statement. 
And uh, certainly not what this verse is saying, where there's no vision, people perish, but he that keeps the law, happy is he. So very quickly, I want to kind of point some things out in relation to what we want to discuss here uh, in continuation. First point, uh, the breeding of chaos. There's a lot of contrasts here, and I think this is where the translation or the interpretation, the application, we'll lose the sight here. Where there is no vision, people perish, be contrasted with the conjunction word there, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And uh, so we have the, the breeding of chaos, the people perish, and that perish is not about people dying, that is not people uh, coming to a uh, quick demise, this is about the very reality. Ultimately what it means is uh, uh, they are, in essence, becoming very chaotic in their lives. They are set loose, is literally the exact meaning there of the Hebrew word. And so where there is no vision, ultimately the breeding of chaos begins. The people begin to perish. They begin to get set loose. They, they wind up with all kinds of, uh, well, they just do what's right in their own eyes. Uh, ultimately, we could go to the example, and I just was seeing that uh, Ryrie had this kind of as a side note as well. The very example of the uh, golden calf is exactly what this is all about. The, the people perish. Uh, they do what seems right in their own eyes, and it only leads to chaos. It only leads to sin. It only leads to, uh, well, certainly the opposite of happiness. Although the intention is, if I do what I think I want, if I have my dreams and pursue them, it will make me happy. Ultimately, the end result is the being more chaos. And isn't that true many times? That uh, there are those who are living very chaotic lives, and it's not often because they got so many balls up in the air, so to speak. Uh, they just are living in chaos. And uh, there's also those who seem to have a gazillion tasks on their plate and seem to be living in happiness and joy and, and peace. And it has nothing to do with our environment, it has nothing to do with our circumstances, it has everything to do with am I pursuing what I want or am I pursuing what God has for me? And when I'm pursuing what God has for me, again, the contrast, there's happiness. When I'm pursuing what I want for me, there is chaos. Or literally, as the verse says, when there is no vision. I imagine you know what that already means, but we'll get to that here in a second. For those that are often living in chaos, and that's just an easy translation of the word perish there. For those that are living in chaos, and if you've ever had a time in your life where it just felt like your lives were getting very chaotic, <coughs> What was our, what is our response to that? What do we do? My life is getting very chaotic and uh, I'm beginning to just lose sight of what is up and what is down. Uh, uh, and I'm just getting, wearing myself out. What is, what is typically, humanly speaking, the next thing we do? Stop everything. Stop everything, yes. We, we try to figure out, all right, uh, what do I not need to do anymore? What, what, and uh, what often takes place then is now we're doing less but oftentimes, still the same amount of chaos in our lives. Uh, we were doing, let's just use a number, 40 different things in a week's time. Now we've cut it down to 10. Our lives are still full of chaos. That's what this last phrase is, the people perish. Or the last part of that first phrase there, the people perish. <coughs> there is that end result of a breeding of chaos. The opposite, or the contrast of happiness, the contrast of blessing. The contrast of peace uh, being contrasted in regards to those who truly have obedience. And uh, so as we consider, before we even get to that reality of the word vision, um, there is the breeding of chaos. And when we set our hearts on what I want, when we determine this is what I think my objectives are, what my goals are, what my New Year's resolutions are, and it's because I want them, Many times we'll end up in chaos. We'll end up in perish because we're not seeking out what God has for us, but what I want for me. And that's to be aware of that. The second one, not only the reading of contrast, chaos, but as we also consider the, the contrast here in the first, there's a discipline of obedience. <clears throat> Obviously, where there is no vision, it's contrasted with those that keep the law. Now, for the Old Testament, the time frame of Proverbs 29, the law obviously was exactly as it is, the law, uh, the thou shalt from God. Uh, thou shalt and thou shalt not, as God has stated to them in the Old Testament law, was exactly what is being contrasted here. Where there is no vision is contrasted with those that keep the law. 
how easy is it at times to actually live out the law? How easy is it at times to actually live out what God has for us? How easy is it at times? How natural is it? Uh, how many times does this just happen? <laughs> I woke up one morning and lo and behold, I was doing everything right. It probably doesn't happen very often. Uh, it is something that we have to work at, something that, that we have to strive to accomplish, something that takes effort, something that takes work, takes commitment, not for our own righteousness, not for our own zealous efforts, but in our desire to serve our God and obey Him, there's a discipline of obedience. And it ultimately boils down to, because we are not living in the New Testament time frame, we still have the law, but what the boils down to, as we put the law, as we look, as we said Sunday, look in the perfect law of liberty, determine what I need to do now. And in essence, results in that question of, what does God have for me? We begin 2019, I'm guessing we all have different, maybe we don't call them resolutions, but we have different goals. We have things that we hope to accomplish this year, we were just discussing, uh, even while you guys were here, uh, uh, a soon trip to uh, uh, Southern California. We hope to get that accomplished here in the next about five weeks or so. And uh, two things in that hope, number one, that AJ finishes, <laughs> finishes the course uh, as well, but then as well, that we were able to get there and, and uh, all that's involved with that as well. And, and so there are a lot of things that you begin a year and you think to yourself, this would be a great year to do, but you fill in the blank. Uh, there are some things that we were discussing that, boy, we haven't been to this or that in many years and it's something that Josiah would probably love. Having even, you know, some things that we may have done when the older boys were younger and uh, just seemed to be the, the good thing to do when they were younger. And now here's Josiah as uh, uh, the youngest and we're realizing, oh, there's a lot of things that we haven't brought him to or done with him. And, uh, well, maybe we should do that sometime. There's some things we could maybe do. And, and uh, so when, we, when you begin a year, it's often the time that we begin to have just those, boy, we'd like to do that this year. We'd like to lose amount of weight. We'd like to do more of this. We'd like to do less of that, whatever it might be. But we have to not neglect the very reality of the responsibility of keeping the law. It's not just about dream big and let your dreams become reality. It's about, God, what do you have for me? What is it that you have for me this year? And as a church, certainly you can go online and look at unlimited numbers of other churches and their ministries and what they do, what they don't do, what works and what doesn't work. And uh, the list is infinite. But the question shouldn't be, how can we be more like them? How can we be like that other church? But ultimately, Lord, what do you have for us? What do you have for me? What is it that I need to do and put into practice in my life? What is it that you've, you know, specifically, what is it that you've gifted me with? What is it that you've given me the means to accomplish that I need to start accomplishing? And uh, to run the race that you have set before me uh, and accomplish it well. And so there's a discipline of obedience that he that keeps the law. He that keeps the law, there's that, again, that end result of happiness. The opposite of chaos, the opposite of perish, the opposite of just being turned loose to our own desires, to our own ambitions, to what we think we want. Uh, again, chaos contrasted happiness, blessing, obedience contrasted to no vision. But as well, here finishing up very quickly, number three, the necessity of vision. The ESV sounds very much like other versions do. It says, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. People cast off restraint is exactly an exact definition of what perish means in the Hebrew. But blessed is he who keeps the law. Where there is no prophetic vision, again, this is Old Testament time frame. It, it was a time frame when men stood up and said, thus saith the Lord. It was a time when men stood up and said, this is what God has for us, whether it be a prophet or a priest or a judge. Uh, or a king. It was, there were men, and even at many times women, who stood up and said, this, this is what God is. This is what God has required of us. This is what God expects of us. And uh, this vision, where there is no vision, is not talking about my dream and my aspirations for 2019, but it has a very reminder of what does God have for me? What is it that he has set before me for this year? For me individually, for us collectively as a church, as a ministry, 
What is it that God has for us? And what has he said that we ought to accomplish? What is it that I need to accomplish for his glory? Because where there is no prophetic vision, where there is no understanding of what God has for us, what happens? Chaos. We do what, what seems right in our own eyes. Uh, we become unrestrained and, and we just follow after our own dreams, our own aspirations. And we neglect what God has for us. So where there is no, where the vision, the reality of what God has for us is gone, we become unrestrained. We pass off restraint. We do what is right in our eyes. We do what we want. But, in contrast, he that keeps the law, he that understands what God has, and then not just an understanding, but an obedience to that, has a result of happiness. As we consider the new year, goals, objectives, something to accomplish, uh, and as even more specifically as a church, uh, I trust that this is not just about fulfilling what our dreams are. I don't know that it's necessarily wrong individually to have dreams and goals, um, but when we consider what God has for us, we ought to be considering what God has for us and uh, be reminded that if I don't know what God has for me, that's a challenge. I don't know what God has for me, and I'm not finding out what God has for me. That course, that direction will lead me to chaos, lead me to perish, lead me to things are not going to be going well for me. But when I know what God has for me, and I know what his task is at hand, and I, I know that he has said, thou shalt, <laughs> and I shall, or God has said, thou shalt not, and I will not, uh, there is blessing, there is happiness. I think sometimes as a church, we can get certainly get into a routine of this is what happens, this is what we do, this is how we do it. And uh, again, many times we even focus on a church, church as uh, you know, three services a week, uh, two hymns, prayer, another hymn, and a message, another song, and we go. And uh, I think it's very easy to get into a mentality that uh, that's what church is all about. Church becomes just what takes place in this building. And, and not only that, but what is written on the bulletin that says we're supposed to be doing when we come together. And this song, this song, this, this prayer, this song, this message, that another song. And uh, we, it's easy to get into those routines all the while forgetting and neglecting what God has called us to do. Ephesians chapter 4. Well, I read about 10 years ago. This was one of my uh, often repeated passages. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, I urge you, I beg of you, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And I know that many of you have heard this many times before, 10 years ago, you've heard it often. My pastor, when I was in uh, high school, uh, there in Woodridge, I don't know if it was this verse, because I don't remember what verse he used. It may have been this verse, but I remember him telling us in high school during chapel times that all of us may have different occupations. And he explained what that was. It's how we make money. It's how we earn a living. It's how we provide. It's how we uh, care for those in need. <clears throat> That's how we pay our bills. But he made it very clear that in our occupation, let us not forget what our vocation is. And he would use those two words. It's your occupation. It's what you do for a living. It's what... what what earns the money to pay the rent and buy the house and uh, put gas in the car and food on the plates and so on and so forth. But let us not forget that that is many times different than what God has called us to do. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't do our occupation, but we must not forget that God has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a mission for each one of us. And uh, he would talk to us. We'd just be sitting in pews just like this, and he'd be right on the floor right in front of us, and he'd, he'd tell us, you know, some of you are going to be missionaries. And I know in... The four years I was there, some of them did turn into missionaries. And some of you are going to be pastors. And actually, quite a few of us turned into pastors. Some of you are going to be uh, evangelists. And, but not all of you are. But all of you have been, if you're a child of God, all of you have been called to serve the Lord in the vocation that he has called you to. And Paul makes it very clear in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. And uh, I try to, what do you say, emphasize the word there, beseech. He's begging this church of Ephesus that they remember their responsibility to fulfill their vocation that God had called them. And uh, it's not just about church being, let's gather together and sing some hymns and listen to a message. 
about the very reality of what has God called me to. For when I don't know what that is, when I'm unclear of that, when I'm not going to the Word of God and find out what God has for me, again, the people perish. But when I know that vocation and I pursue that vocation, I live out that vocation, regardless of my occupation, but when I live out that vocation, there's happiness, there's blessing. And uh, what a challenge. We'll continue on with verse 11. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and, he, and teachers. But ultimately, it would be the role of those gifts, I guess you could say. Many times after those are considered gifts. What would ultimately be the role of those gifts? Pastor, evangelist, pastors, teachers. The incorrect answer would be to proclaim new revelation from God. That would be the very incorrect revelation because we live in the New Testament time. We live after the end of revelation when nothing more is going to be added. Nothing else should be subtracted. But ultimately, what, what, it, what is the role of the apostles? We got apostles, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They use those same words. That's what I'm saying. Yes, about. yes. <laughs> I can't think of them. <laughs> Sharing the gospel. Correct, okay. And teaching what? Correct, yes. Discipling. Discipleship, yes. Yeah, I was going to say something along the line of discipleship, just helping us all to be what, yes. what God wants us to be. Correct. Pointing us in the right direction. Exactly. Sometimes maybe smacking us upside the head, whatever we need. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. At, at times, yes. And while the. Uh, the vision, so to speak, as the King James translated, is very different. This day and age, and it was at that day and age, there's still a responsibility to declare, hey, this is what God has for us. This is what God has said we ought to be doing. And uh, I think it's these, many times these roles, not that only these people can do this, but these are roles that are fulfilling the responsibility of saying, you know, through discipleship, through training, through evangelism, through, uh, uh, not for you, what my dad just said, Beating people across the head, or whatever the word phrase he said there. But here's what God has for us. Uh, this is it. And, and we need to accomplish it. We need to live it. We need to put it into practice. It should not just go in one ear and out the other. It shouldn't just rattle around in our heads as knowledge, but it should go into our hearts and change our lives. For the very reason that if we don't know what God has for us, we are left to our own restraint. We become unrestrained to His purpose, and we become focused on my purpose, which only leads to chaos. But when I know what God has for me, there's happiness, there's blessing. And uh, there are times that God uses these people. Uh, I can say in my life, there have been many times that an evangelist or a pastor or uh, even a teacher has come and, uh, you know, those phrases, the pastor teacher seems to be a one person instead of two, kind of a pastor being defined as a teacher, so to speak, as many seem to interpret it. Nonetheless, I've had a lot of people in my life. Uh, that would fill one of those roles that have had a great impact on my life. To challenge me into, this is what God has for you. I had a long discussion with my pastor, again the same guy, who spoke on my vocation. Long discussion in his uh, living room. When he was telling me that uh, he really thought that I was supposed to go into ministry. And I thought that that seemed to be the very wrong thing for me because I can't talk to anybody. I don't have, I, I, I don't have that ability. I can't talk. I don't, I'm, I don't know. I, I'm, I sit in the pew and do nothing and listen, take great notes, maybe make a great application in my life, but I can't be the one to talk in front of people. That scared the daylights out of me. And I remember him just staring at me. No, I, I said, I think you really need to pray about this. I think you really need to consider this. I, I, I not that he was saying, this is what you are. This is what you're going to do. I have this new revelation from God and this is what you <laughs> He wasn't saying that, but just reminding me that, hey, there's something that God has for you. What is it? And I'll do it. And uh, I'm thankful for those that have done that in my life. In the very next verse then, looking at the reality of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, their role, as we just discussed, is for this purpose. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And again, I know that you've heard this before if you've been in the church very long. Uh, but the role of those apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers are in essence, I use an E word to equip us, to equip all of us to do the work that God has called us to. 
Because again, the entire vision is that where there is no vision. When I don't know what God has for me, or maybe when I do know, and I refuse to keep it, I might even know what it is, but I refuse to do it. The contrast again is perish versus happy. Now there's blessing when I know and I do, as opposed to knowing and not doing, or not knowing and not having a clue. I'm either going to perish, I'm going to become unrestrained, I'm going to go after my own desires and leave my life in a chaos, or I'm going to find blessing and right and doing what God has called me to do. And uh, I think that there are times that God calls us for different things at different times, different seasons of our life. And I think we need to be aware of that. Um, but ultimately, if we're still alive, it looks like most of us still are. The size of the question right now is quite still, which is abnormal for him. <laughs> but here's Snore. <laughs> we're still alive. We still have another breath in our life, in our hearts, in our, in our lungs. That means that we still have a task to accomplish. And that we need to know what God has for us to do. And then we need to individually accomplish that. We come together here, not to just sing songs and hear a message. We should be coming here together to be challenged, rejuvenated, and uh, find, I hope, rest, but as well a challenge to go back out and do what God has told us to do and uh, accomplish the task that he has for us. So that being said, Trying to avoid the breeding of chaos, understanding the discipline of obedience, and understanding the necessity of knowing what God has for us, and realizing that it, how do I want to say this? I'm going to say this without causing offense. There are churches, bigger, maybe smaller, there are churches of various sizes compared to ours, uh, that are doing different things than us. And, uh, Sometimes they do them very well. Sometimes maybe they should just stop stop doing that. It's not working. Um, and there's a lot of illustrations, a lot of examples. There's a lot of, you can go online and find a whole host of things that people will say, every church should be doing this. You should do this, this, and this, and this. Depending on what group you're with, every church should have a bus ministry. Every church should have an Awana program. Every church should have uh, a senior citizens program. Every church should have a men's ministry or a ladies ministry. Every church should have this. Every church should have that. And uh, I think ultimately, as we consider what God has for us, it's not about a collective, this is what God has for Faith Baptist Church, but what Faith Baptist Church is to be doing is what God has called us individually to do. And to be reminded of that task. I think it would be great if in 2019, every single one of us would be able to say, this is the vocation that God's called me to. I don't exactly understand it all, but I, I want to learn more about it and I want to dive into God's word and figure out how I can better do it. And I want to seek out opportunities through the church to be able to accomplish that and uh, to be able to, to move forward in that regard and, and uh, allow what God has called us to do to direct our ministry as opposed to saying, well, that looks like a great idea. <laughs> uh, they do it over there and that seems to work out really well. So maybe we should just do that too and see what happens. But what has God called us to uh, for a while there, we had a uh, vacation Bible school. We had several adults that were, uh, well, one of them, you know, I'm, I would guess you would know, uh, Howard Gates. Well, he was there at the principal at the same time you guys were. Uh, he was he was a hoot with kids. And uh, you almost couldn't, you couldn't, I'm going to do the negative, ne double negative there, you could not have <laughs> a vacation Bible school when Howard Gates was here. What was that? Stanley Stumble. Stanley Stumble, exactly. Stanley Stumble, year after year, we had Stanley Stumble. And uh, I never knew what that guy was going to bring. I, mean, he just, yeah, I would just have him do a skit uh, before my challenge. And I had no idea what he was going to do. And most of the time, it left me completely speechless. So now what do I say? Uh, but I don't know. Could you say that he had the gift of goofiness? I don't know. He just had the gift of being able to tear down walls with kids. I think is what a great way of saying it. And uh, that's, he was greatly gifted at that. And uh, we put in the work in that regard. And uh, I think a lot of success in that. People, we had a lot of kids that came, I think, if nothing else, to see Stanley Stumble. And uh, how many times even after vacation Bible school is over, and uh, maybe we have a park thing in the park, you know, a meal in the park, or whatever, as we still do. And one of the kids would come up and see him. Hey, Stanley! It's Howard is his name, but Stanley! He just became known as Stanley. 
You know, what is it that we all, God has given us the means, the ability, the heart, the desire, the challenge, the vision, the correct terminology to accomplish, and how can we live that out in 2019? Individually, and then as well collectively. I finished it all along with Stanley Seaman, and then after they left, and uh, a couple other people that were great helpers either moved away or, or left the church, and, and uh, we didn't have a lot of uh, BBS type workers stop doing that. You know, we could force it, but if we don't have those that are called to do this, that are challenged to do this, that have that, thus say the Lord, and this is, this is what God has gifted me to do, and, and let's run with it. Uh, I don't know that a church should force a ministry just because another church is doing it. But if we have those that have the means and the ability, and they're doing nothing because we don't have it, then we need to do it. <laughs> so that they, you put into practice that, which um, that was gifted to them, even if it is a stand and stumble. <laughs> um, and all the goofiness that that entailed as well, year after year. With that being said, kind of thinking along the lines of preparing us for business meeting here in two weeks, and we have about 12 minutes left. Uh, any thoughts, ideas, something that the Lord has placed on your hearts that you thought, you know what? I really think this would be great for us, a great avenue for me to use my ability that God has given to me. Uh, spiritual gift that God has given to me, and uh, I want to put this to practice, and let's see if we can see if we can get this going, and uh, kind of increase our borders, expand our horizons, so to speak, uh, beyond that. I, I think there's an endless amount of things that this church could do, probably even an endless amount of things that this church could do that wouldn't even cost very much as far as the budget goes. But I can also say this, if it's something that God has called us to, uh, what's the old terminology, the, the phrase, God won't lead you? Somewhere where he's not going to provide the means. I know that really slaughtered in the phrase there, but uh, if it's what God has for us, I can tell you that he will provide whatever is necessary for us to do that. Any thoughts? I know this gets very personal. What, um, I have a heart for this, but I also have a request for help because I can't do it by myself. Um, I have a visitation for... Um, with Mr. Colmar here, and then Mrs. Dustin not driving anymore, and obviously Mrs. Lister not driving. It's just those three, and they're so close. Yes. And they're, you know, to each other. It just feels like another year always slips by with good intentions, but it's, and I know it has to start with me, and I get that. But it'd be great also as a church if we found ways to just really make sure we yes. incorporated them into yes. what we consider church. Correct. Exactly, yes. Certainly, as you consider these, obviously, that's, a, that's actually a biblical mandate as well. <laughs> that there's the vision, thus saith the Lord. Uh, that is something that we ought to be doing as a church, and uh, especially those that, I shouldn't say have that heart's desire, but that ultimately should be their, all of our desires. Um, yes? Correct. Yes. Your thoughts, it's thinking along internally, I guess we'll do it this way, internally to, for us. Again, you look at all the one another's that the Bible calls us to do, and that's, that's what this is all about. This is what this is about, is accomplish those one another's. Uh, what is it, like 90 of them, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around 100 ish. Uh, one another's that were, are in the New Testament, we're told to do. We have a responsibility to each other when we gather together. And uh, when you think about the different age groups, obviously that would be one demographic, those that are shut in. Obviously we have the youngers, and uh, then we have the teen committee that was meeting beforehand. I'm not exactly sure what they're accomplishing, but they were meeting nonetheless. And uh, then we have the rest of us, those throw us all in the teen groups there. Uh, certainly there's a lot that I think we could be doing for each of those groups and uh, encourage us to consider that. What, what, can we, what can we do as a group? One thing I don't necessarily need answers tonight, but before two weeks is um, just throwing out that we do it every year as a vacation Bible school. If we have the means, if we have the heart, if we have the help. Um, I always loved vacation Bible school. Actually, we really loved it with Sam Stumple as well. He added a lot. Um, but there's a lot of work to do when we only have 
three VBS age kids and kids in our church. It means a lot of effort, a lot of work, a lot of commitment from a lot of people uh, to have something that's more than just the three. Um, and um, but consider that something we can discuss. Um, again, I don't want to just do it because other churches do. I don't want to do it because we feel like we have to do it. Um, but if there's enough that say, you know what, I would really love to be able to engage in kids' lives that way, then I think we should. I think we must. Because if we know what God has for us and we refuse to do it, we lead to our own chaos. We follow after our own desires and uh, it leads us nowhere helpful. We do what God has called us to do. There is happiness, there's blessing, there's, there's uh, ultimately, you can even say enjoyment in doing what God has called us to do. Another thought I have is, I'm just not sure on the when, but because the four teens that we have are girls, and we have ladies in the church, I've been wondering how we could have a ladies team, you know, a Bible study like we used to have. Or a, I just don't know the logistics of it, but it just seems like we should be able to group together because it says older women teach the younger they just, teens all happen to be girls right now. So it seems like something, but I'm open for thoughts and ideas. Yes. It just seems like the perfect time to yes. grow as older women and also train the young women. Correct. I just don't know when. And sort of the uh, objective kind of, uh, throwing this out there as well, kind of already said it. Ephesians 4, again, the objective of the pastor is not to do every aspect of the ministry. And that also, I think, includes the pastor's wife as well. Now, this isn't just figuring out what more we can do, uh, but what more we can do together. And uh, I know that my wife is very suited to be able to lead a, uh, a lady to Bible study because she's done, for many years she has done that. In numerous churches she's done that. And, uh, but encouraging all of us. Now, there might be ladies that so, you know, I'm not, I really could not do the whole give a devotional type thing, but I'd uh, love to be able to host it, or I'd love to be able to bring the treats, and uh, I'd love to be able to do the invites and, and whatever it might be there, the follow-ups. Uh, ultimately, Ephesians 4, again, is to equip us to do the work that God has called us individually to do, and uh, that's the objective of the church. And uh, ultimately, as a pastor, that's my objective, as a pastor's wife, although she doesn't necessarily have that objective, but as my partner in crime, <laughs> uh, uh, hand that objective off to her as well to enable all of us to be able to live out what God has called us to do. Uh, we've had <laughs> we've had some great, uh, many years here, we've had some great ideas as far as ministry goes, and many times it was solely, many times it was just what can Jen could do. And uh, we have tried fervently to try to avoid that. Not that I don't want her to do anything. I think she does a tremendous a lot already, but this isn't about what can Jennifer Newton do? <laughs> but what can we all do? What has God called each one of us to do? And how can we put that puzzle together and accomplish his work that he's called us to do? The option, the contrast is chaos or happiness. Chaos or happiness. So I need to know what God has for me and I need to do it. And I need to keep it. I, I need to live it out. That's the happiest part of it. Otherwise, if I don't know or I do know and I refuse to do it, yeah, I am just following my own restraint that I'm just doing what I want. And uh, that's the opposite of happiness. And... Uh, Want to be able to have us fulfill what God has called us to be, each of us. I have a whole list of things that I have my wife do, <laughs> and uh, many of most of the that she does already. Um, but what is it that we individually? Again, I'm not trying to ask for personal example right tonight, but just encourage us to think along those lines for 2019 for our ministry, um, for the business meeting in two weeks. And hopefully, we can discuss this in a little greater detail. What is it that God has called you? Whoever you are, even teenagers, uh, God has given a role for that. And uh, what is it that God can do for ministry? Thankful that Kate does this, although I'm not very thankful that there's actually cameras staring at me. Um, and uh, she does the, the PowerPoint. And uh, there's things that Caitlin can do. And there's, I can say there's a lot more that Caitlin can do. And uh, the rest as well. And uh, what is it that God has enabled us to be, have the means to do? That we might even say, well, that's, that's not really anything big. You know, just this, just as an example, and again, I keep trying to avoid just looking right into the lens, but just as an example, uh, we've had a lot of comments from people that I don't think would ever walk through these doors that are listening to our services online. And that's just something Caitlin does for the tripod sitting right in front of her. 
And uh, what an opportunity that we have in a very simple way, cost nothing, so for the tripod, <laughs> cost nothing, uh, but to be able to have an impact in others' lives even beyond this building, I think is, is a treasure. So what else can we all be doing in that regard? The Lord has called us to do that much one more. Any other thoughts? Samantha, the inspector earlier on. Yes. Yes. It's just kind of how do we keep in contact with? I mean, I, I don't even know her last name, but I know where she lives because yeah. she bought the new or the the board. Oh, oh, was, oh, really? Yeah. So I did not know. This was the old one. Yeah. Ah. I mean, but, but there are other people that we don't really know because we haven't. Been in the church that long, but yes. they pop in and pop out. It's like, how do you encourage them? Do they need encouragement for not right. just to come and be a body here, but to, yes. you know, if they're part of the body of Christ, they need interaction. You know, yes. yes. And how can we reach out? And Correct. Exactly. I think the, yes. the ways of doing that are really endless. Again, it's just kind of like you were saying about visitation, it's just a matter of. Of accomplishing it and having those that are willing to help and, and assist yes, in that. Right. Having yes. someone who's willing to say, here's an idea, but then getting us to help them. Correct. But Correct. someone with an idea and an ability. And I like that, uh, the way you said that. Um, I'm not trying to critique your past judgment or point fingers or anything, but I, I think that uh, a lot of times the church it's a, a wrong objective sometimes when it's all about we need more people, we need more people, we need more people. And uh, honestly, I would love to have more people. Uh, so I understand that objective. Uh, but the way you said it, I think is exactly, it's, it's not just about coming to sit in a pew. It's about, it's about the interactions. Again, it's the one another being played out in our lives in the body of Christ. And uh, that's a challenge because that, that's not just for Sundays then. That's Sundays and Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays. And that we ought to have a responsibility and, and understanding what God has called us to do in that regard as well. But yes, a lot, a lot to, should be and could be done there as well. And we have had actually in this last year, there's been several that have just out of the loop shown up. And that's a huge blessing. But what an opportunity that we have to be a blessing even outside of these doors. <laughs> Nothing? Johnny, you got something? <laughs> From Sunday's uh, illustration, and John's going John's gonna to start a uh, Karate class. Oh, <laughs> Knock some people out for Christ. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I encourage you just to think along those lines again? I'm not just looking for ideas of what we could do, but specifically, what has God called each one of us? Uh, each one of us, if we are a child of God, God has given us spiritual gifts to accomplish, and. Uh, I guess the purpose of this way, sometimes those spiritual gifts, I don't think are always necessarily what is comfortable to us. If I can say it that way. Um, but when we can get stuff out of our comfort zones and we realize God is doing a great thing through this. Uh, I never expected it. And uh, I, I, I think it's just a matter of us being real willing to say, or what do you have for me to do in my life? In your great vast work, even here in just a small community, but what? What is it that you have for me to do? And I'm, I'm not very comfortable with this. I'm not real, maybe even at times, not real excited about this. But I want to do what you called me to do because I know that you called me to do it. And uh, what a joy that can be. I think I've shared this before too, but in uh, right after college, church in uh, Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, I asked, I, I asked the pastor, hey, here I am a Bible college graduate. I, I like to do whatever you, what do you need? And uh, I know I've shared this before, but, his answer was, every Sunday there's a nursing home service. I finish preaching here and I'm exhausted. I'd rather go home and take a nap. It's yours. And uh, I know I've said this before, but I remember thinking that and said, today, it's yours today. 
Uh, well, I had not prepared any. I did not know that one hour from asking him, I was going to be standing in front of, this is a very large nursing home group. It was a pretty big group, um, much bigger than what we have here. Yeah, it was a pretty large group, and uh, I had no idea that in, in an hour I was going to be standing before them and, and uh, presenting a message to them. And uh, I can't tell you how nervous I was. I don't think I could even eat lunch that day after church. Just, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? How am I going to do it? I've never done this before. Wow. Wow. And uh, what was it, like two years we did that or so? And then together, yeah. kind of like we still do, she that many times was the music. She did the music part, she took care of all that, and then I uh, presented the message. But it became where you could really see God was doing something. And when you're doing it every week, every Sunday afternoon, the same nursing home, the same people, and uh, just hearing their testimony of what God is doing in their life because of just a 15 minute challenge, um, it reminded me again that well, there are times that God calls us to do something that is way beyond our comfort zone. And so don't look at, well, what am I comfortable doing? Look at what has God called me to do? What has God given me the opportunity and I can do that? I can get it accomplished. And uh, let's determine what that is and then do it. Because when we don't know what God has for us, when we don't know what God has commanded us, we will follow after our own ambitions, our own desires, our own goals, and the word perish is used in the King James. ESV says they cast off restraint. It has that idea of we just pursue and do what is right in our own eyes. But when we know what God has for us and we keep it, we live it, we do it, there's blessing, there's happiness, there's joy. And of all the things that uh, we left when we left that church, we moved about an hour away. I have to admit one of the things I missed most was that nursing home service every Sunday. Never thought that would have happened. Um, but what a joy, what a happiness there is, what a blessing there is when we follow what God has called us to do and do it. And again, it's from the youngest to the oldest. Uh, God has something for all of us to do. So the word of prayer, I'll leave you in your thoughts. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your word. I thank you for this uh, simple challenge from this very simple verse. I pray that we grasp the application to us as we consider your work that we each have been given a responsibility to accomplish. And I pray that wouldn't be just uh, a number of us as single lighthouses, a single island trying to accomplish work individually, but we realize even how, how you have fitly joined us together to accomplish your work here together. And I just pray that uh, you just renew a a hunger and a thirst after what you have for us, but then as well to accomplish what you have for us. And uh, we thank you for what you'll do. Pray that as we go our separate ways, uh, that you use us, that you give us a vision to see uh, you in our lives, in our hearts, as well as opportunities that we have to share you in the lives of others as well. And if you tarry, and uh, if we do as well, I pray that you bring us back again on Sunday to worship you together. In Jesus' name, amen.